Topic Notes 11.2, Lower Invertebrates. So now it's time for us to really get into the different phyla, and of course we're going to start with the inverts. But before we do that, we've got to do a little bit of groundwork in terms of what's an animal. And this is the perfect picture to talk about that. This is a picture I took down in the Keys, and it's of a sponge. And most people don't realize what sponges really are or how they work. And that you really are looking at a living animal that's actively preying on zooplankton. So it took even scientists a long time to kind of catch up with this because there are quite a lot of varieties of animals out there on this planet. And they don't always fit our expectations. So let's take a look at it. For starters, here are our main ideas. Animals are defined by a specific set of characteristics, including being multicellular heterotrophs. Invertebrates include some of the most diverse animal groups on the planet, exhibiting a vast range of adaptations, and they play critical roles in the marine environment. And here are your learning goals for this lecture listing the basic characteristics of animals, differentiating between invertebrates and vertebrates, and then we're going to go into some specifics about some of the different invertebrate phyla. And these two learning goals are going to be the same over the next two note sets. Today we're going to be covering three different phyla, and of course we'll continue on on the next lecture. So what is an animal? This might seem like a silly question because an animal is an animal, right? Well, the earth and the, the diversity of life is a little bit more complex than we initially thought. And so things, especially like sponges, sea anemones, corals, we really didn't frame up as representing what we know of as animals. Even things like barnacles, which to us look like they're sessile sitting there attached to a rock all the time. It took scientists a little while to understand what it is to be an animal and kind of define that particular term. And today we have a certain amount of characteristics that we attribute to anything we call an animal. First, of course, is that they are multicellular. That's a big one. Next is that they are eukaryotic, meaning that they have membrane-bound organelles and all of that nucleus and stuff that you learned back in biology, right? and that they lack cell walls. Now remember, cell walls are found in plant cells. So these, again, are things you've learned about in biology. We're just referencing here. Animals are also considered heterotrophs. Now remember back to our talk about uh, energetics in the marine system and ecology. Heterotrophs can't produce their own food. All right? They have to obtain food by consuming it. This is different than autotrophs, which are plants and algaes that go through photosynthesis. So animals don't do that. They are heterotrophs. They cannot produce their own food. Animals are also considered motile during some stage in their life cycle. Now, motile means they move around. Now, you might say, hold on, a coral doesn't move around. No, an adult coral doesn't, but their larval forms do. So that is the key difference in the stipulation that we have. In some form in their life cycle, they move around. Now that we've got the characteristics of animals out of the way, let's differentiate between invertebrates and vertebrates. Now again, this is one that you should have covered before in previous courses, but I find sometimes it gets a little confusing. If you reach around to your back and you feel that ridge, that bony ridge running up and down your back that's holding your body up, that is your vertebral column, okay? That is your backbone. Vertebrates have that backbone, okay? Whether it's a fish, whether it's pilot whales, like you see there on the bottom right picture, they all have a backbone. If you have that vertebral column, you are a vertebrate. If you do not, if you do not have that backbone, you are an invertebrate. That's an animal that lacks a vertebral column. An example of this, of course, is a sea anemone. 
and pretty much everything we're going to talk about in this note set and 8.3 note set, uh, both the uh, lower and higher invertebrates. All invertebrates, no backbone, no vertebral column. All right, let's jump into the first of our marine invertebrate phyla that we are going to cover. And the first one is phylum periphera, or the sponges. Now, you can break their name down using Latin, uh, the term porous, meaning poor and fair to bear. So really, literally, their names mean to bear pores. And this is very specific to the characteristics of sponges, and we'll get to that in a minute. But before we get too deep, let's talk a little bit about evolutionary connections here, because we've already started to set up that uh, in our talk on classification and embryology. Sponges are the complete weirdo sort of group in the animal kingdom. And this actually makes a certain amount of sense after we've done a lot of research in how they relate to other animal phyla that we have on the planet today. We know that sponges diverge from the what we consider the ancestral animal some 750 million years ago. So if you're looking at a cladogram with sponges and all the other animals on it, sponges separate off from everything else long, long, long before just about anything else started to diverge. So sponges are really out there in terms of their relation to other animals. But remember that sponges are still a modern animal. They have undergone changes through all that time, and they have been completely separated from all other animals for all that time, evolving to their current state. But sponges still remain the most primitive animals on the planet. And thus, it gives us a bit of an insight into what the first animal may have looked like uh, or how it may have come together. So let's look at some of the basic characteristics of sponges. Now, I already mentioned the pore bearing thing in the Latin. This is the key. And if I'm to ask you what is the major characteristic of phylum periphera, you're going to say they're pore bearing. Uh, and that's really the key thing. They have pores that go through their bodies, and this is really important in terms of transporting water, uh, feeding, uh, and, and pretty much doing everything they do. And we'll get into that in a minute. But they are also what we consider asymmetric, otherwise meaning they have no symmetry whatsoever. They're just globular doing weird things. Or they can be radially symmetric, uh, which you see oftentimes in barrel sponges or even in the tubes within a branching sponge as well. And each, all of these uh, body parts, whether they're asymmetrical or uh, radially symmetric, have a series of canals in them. Now, the structural units, basically, that make up their skeletal system, if you will, uh, happen to be what we call spicules. And these spicules can be small, calcareous, or siliceous little fragments and they tend to come in all sorts of shapes and sizes if you look at the image on the right both the right uh top and bottom there are black and white images those are of spicules found within a sponge and they are hard parts uh, and they kind of help give rigidity to the sponge structure woven through all that is generally a fibrous protein called spongin and that's what you see on the bottom two pictures spongin fibers so you'll have a mixture of these two making up the different sponges. And of course, there's various different types of sponges that have uh, more of a composition one way or the other. And we're not going to get into that during this particular talk. Um, we're just going to focus on the basics. Now, one of the things that uh, really supports this concept that peripherins are very primitive, they do not have organs or what we consider true tissues. Now, these are very much hallmarks of most other animals, but they do not have that. What they do have are a series of specialized cell types that function within the whole of the sponge to do different things. Now, we're not going to go through all of the different cell types. That's a whole other talk much deeper into sponges, but I am going to talk about one type of cell that is found in sponges that's very, very important. 
they're called the coanocytes. And they're also known as collar cells, if that's easier for you to say than coanocytes. Um, but the collar cells or the coanocytes are flagellated cells. Basically, they're these little cells that have a flagella. And they line the interior portions of the sponge, and they beat their flagella and create a water current. This water current is really important to the whole functionality of the sponge. As you might guess, an adult sponge cannot move around. They rely on these coanocytes to create a water current that will draw water into the sponge and back out of the sponge. So you might guess by this whole current flowing through the sponge that they must be filter feeders, and you would be correct. Sponges are filter feeders. They go after plankton, specifically zooplankton. And in the picture on the bottom right, you'll see this large sponge and this yellow stuff spewing out of its osculum, its big opening. That yellow stuff is actually just a basic food dye, uh, a yellow food dye. And what they do to demonstrate the water current within the sponge is you'll put the, the food coloring in the water around the sponge and you'll watch that yellow food coloring get sucked up into the sponge and spewed out the osculum. This is showing you the water current and it's actually a much stronger current than you would imagine from something that's just sitting there. And it's all because of those flagellated cells, those coanocytes or collar cells. Now feeding obviously is a big thing. Plankton that happens to be in the water will come through the sponge and as that water and the plankton come through the sponge, the sponge is able to trap that plankton and ingest it. Similarly, animals have other bodily functions, right? They have to get rid of waste, nitrogenous waste, uh, and they can do that through the stream as well. That X current will carry away bodily waste. This also is apparent in reproduction. Now, sponges can uh, go through what we call asexual reproduction, which means they're not dealing with, you know, egg and sperm cells or anything. Uh, and they can do this through what we call budding or fragmentation. And if you look at the picture on the right, this purple sponge with all the branches, that's showing budding happening from the same sponge. Basically, another tube will sprout out and start to grow. Also, sponges can fragment into pieces, and those pieces can fall somewhere and start to grow a new sponge as well. So that's all asexual reproduction. Now here in this little reefscape here, you'll see there's the blue sponge hanging out in the middle there, and you can see all the little buds coming up all over. The red sponge also you see budding going on, but also this is where a lot of times uh, waves might fragment some of it off, and it'll start growing somewhere else and just keep spreading. But sexual reproduction really is dependent on that flow of water through the sponge. So as it turns out, the sperm is released into the water uh, column, and from there, the sperm will be sucked into another sponge through the incurrent siphon of that other sponge. The eggs are fertilized internally, interestingly enough, inside the sponge, and the larval forms are then released into the water column through the X current. So that is how sexual reproduction happens with a sponge. You don't actually have to move anywhere. You just have to move the larvae and the sperm cells around. Now, phylum perfer sponges have all sorts of different things going on with them that make them very important, uh, both to us and from an ecology perspective. So I'm going to start by uh, talking a little bit about their community ecology, which relates to what we can utilize for us humans. Sponges produce what we call a metabolites. Um, these metabolites are chemicals that will do things for the sponge. Remember, sponges cannot get up and move around. They can't um, fight something off physically. So they have to use these metabolites. And these metabolites can prevent uh, settlement of particular types of encrusting growth. Uh, whether it be algae or other things, and they can prevent grazing by other organisms. So we've been doing a lot of research about what these metabolites can possibly do, because if you have a chemical that's being produced by an organism that retards the growth of particular cells, 
that just might be interesting to us, especially from a pharmaceutical or a drug discovery perspective. Um, I'm sure somebody, maybe you knew or you're in your family, may have had experiences with cancer. I know people in my life have. Uh, cancer is one of those uh, issues that we've actually been looking at sponges and these metabolites for possible answers. And there are now several uh, drugs in clinical trials based off of chemicals we've found from sponges. And that makes sponges pretty important to us. Now, from again, from an ecological perspective, sponges are also pretty important to the marine environment. On the right side, we have a big loggerhead sponge, uh, that bottom picture for the right. And they can be really large. I mean, they can be to the point where they're, you know, you wrap your hands around them and you can barely do it. They can get pretty big. Um, now, these big sponges have lots of canals in them which flow the water. Well, it's not just water going in those canals. Other species from the area will actually inhabit those canals, especially invertebrates specifically. Uh, shrimps, crabs, brittle stars, even little tiny fish will. It basically serves as this huge like apartment complex for invertebrates that they live within this sponge. So that actually has a pretty important role in the community as a habitat. Other organisms will hang out on the surface of the sponge. Here you'll see an arrowhead crab hanging out on this red sponge. And again, it's using it sort of for its little home or habitat and protection. Also, some invertebrates like to take the sponge and use it for either defense or camouflage. Decorator crabs do this as well. And the picture to the left is a decorator crab with sponge on the back of its um, carapace. And this happens to be uh, one that we've actually had in our tanks before. Um, and this little decorator crab was very uh, bright orange when it was younger. And it would continue to collect uh, sponge that was in the tank uh, anytime uh, it shed its molt. And then it would just reattach more sponge onto it and grow the sponge. Kind of a nice little mutualistic relationship because the sponge gets moved around to areas with better current and possible for filtration and feeding. Uh, and the crab gets protection because not a whole lot of things like to eat a sponge, especially uh, because of the spicules involved. Um, they're not particularly uh, well edible for most species. There are a few that can. Uh, and so it makes it a little bit less edible and uh, it camouflages the crab as well, it makes it look like something else. So these are just a few reasons why uh, perforins and sponges in general are pretty important. All right, the next phylum we're going to cover is phylum Cnidaria. And again, if you break down the Greek, uh, nide basically means nettle or thread. And this actually has to do with, again, the most Im kind of most defining characteristic for this group. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, as you might have guessed, cnidarians equal corals and sea anemones and jellyfish. So... Let's get a little bit into the characteristics now. Now, generally, we consider uh, cnidarians to either be radial or biradially symmetric. Now, radial, basically, think about a pizza pie, and you cut it up into the different slices. The slices are all the same size and shape. All right? When we talk about biradial, we're just talking about being able to cut it in half, and it's the same on either side. Kind of looking at the tubular anemone for that particular example. Now, remember when we talked about sponges, I said they did not have true tissues. Now, when we've also mentioned embryological development, we did mention tissues. And here we do have tissues. Phylum cnidaria is diploblastic. So they have two different germ layers. This happens to be uh, the endoderm and the ectoderm. And those layers are featured with a gastrovascular cavity lined by that endoderm. Um, that gastrovascular cavity is basically like a gut. In fact, really, all of these guys are, are basically gut sacs within one open mouth. Now, the mouth actually also happens to function as the anus as well, but, you know, we'll get into that in a minute. But again, just keep in mind, we have organized tissues, and there's actually a nerve net in, in cnidarians as well. So they can actually start to use nerve impulses to detect things and uh, react to things. Now we're going to get into the defining 
feature of phylum Cnidaria. So if I ask you for the most important characteristic of phylum Cnidaria, it will be the nematocytes, also called the nematocysts, and that is the stinging cells. N Cnidarians have stinging cells. Now remember back to that Greek uh, nettle or thread. That's actually what it's referring to. That's the, what why the name is actually what it is, Cnidaria. And the stinging cells are set up it, it, like a little hairpin trigger with a coiled harpoon-like um, feature within the cell. And as soon as that hairpin trigger is actually activated, the harpoon will shoot out of the natocyte, the stinging cell, and inject itself into whatever is out there that's nearby that it's touching. Um, generally the prey item or whatever is threatening. And that is the stinging reflex. And you can see that whole uh, sequence diagram to the bottom left. And also you can see an actual microscope image with the different natocytes with their little hairpin triggers, the natocells, uh, sticking out. Um, so every cnidarian has stinging cells, and they have lots of them, uh, literally thousands per little area. I mean, they literally just have a ton of them. So why do they have stinging cells? The two primary reasons for this. First of all, they can use them to kill prey. And remember, cnidarians are animals. They're heterotrophs. They're actively going after food. So this allows them to kill prey and bring it into their gut sac, their mouth. Remember, I told you they're basically a, a, a gut sac with a mouth. Well, that mouth is surrounded usually by tentacles with matocysts on them or sting cells on them. And so that's really the, the biggest function there. And then also just defense. Um, again, most of these animals, whether they're uh, the polyp form, which on the right, you can see these two different forms. The polyp form is like an anemone or a coral where they're stuck sort of in one place. Or the medusa form, which is more like a jellyfish. And e either way, these are drifters that can't exactly get away from things very fast. So defense is definitely a key component to uh, the presence of these stinging cells as well. So both killing prey and for defending themselves. And... Either way, you have these two various different body options, the polyps form or the medusa form. Now we're going to look very briefly at the diversity within phylum Cnidaria, which is quite extensive. Uh, and we're going to look at several different classes. Now we're not going to get in depth in any of these classes, but we're just going to briefly state sort of what they are and what's in them. The first is class Hydrozoa, and this is really well known for the Portuguese man of war, uh, which you can see pictured on the left and uh, the picture directly next to it on the right is its tentacles, um, which is very much a painful situation if you've ever had the pleasure of getting involved with it. Um, man of war are, are pretty, pretty stingy. Uh, also related in this group are the fire corals. Now the picture, kind of the middle uh, bottom picture is a fire coral. And fire coral is not actually named because of the color. It's kind of a mustardy color with some white tips, and it can be flat. In this particular picture, it's actually growing on top of an old gargonian, so it looks branchy, but that's just what it's growing on. And fire coral pretty much is uh, named for the way it makes you feel when, it when you touch it. <laughs> so fire coral can be kind of crazy that way. These plant-like things are actually hydroids, and they sting as well. They're very much related to fire coral. And the picture on the right is a siphonophore, and they actually can get really long, especially in the open ocean and the deep sea. So these are all in class Hydrozoa. Then we have class Scyphozoa, and this is your true jellyfish. And, uh, you know, the, the center picture down there is of a moon jelly, which is kind of common in our neck of the woods. Then you got the sea nettle on the right and the upside down jelly on the left bottom, which is the uh, Cassiopeia. You can find them throughout the Keys and South Florida. They, they're they kind of neat. They lay on the bottom with their tentacles facing up. Um, but uh, what I will note here, and although we're not going to go into it in detail, um, the jellyfish in general, that form that you see drifting around as plankton in the plankton community is just their adult form. Uh, 
they do have other stages and that's that picture on the top right you see the adult moon jelly and then you'll see um, the various different the different phases um, b would be the larval form and then it goes into basically a type of polyp form on the sea floor and that polyp form will give rise to multiple little what we call a phyra that will eventually develop into an adult jellyfish so they actually do have a sessile uh, stage within their uh, life cycle. And of course, jellyfish can sting, but some of them don't sting as much as others. It really just depends on the species. The next class is Cubozoa, which includes box jellyfish and sea wasps. Now, these guys are really well known for their venom. In fact, the venom is considered to be among the most deadly in the world containing toxins that attack the heart, nervous systems, and the skin. It's so overpowering and painful that human victims have been known to go into shock and even die of heart failure before reaching shore or help. Um, and if you do survive it, generally they, uh, there's significant long-lasting effects in terms of pain uh, and eventually significant scarring. They're kind of crazy, but on the flip side of things, box jellies are kind of among the most advanced jellyfish they have. They actually have these eyes that are on the top of their bell that have sophisticated lenses, retinas, irises, corneas, the whole shebang. And scientists don't really completely understand how they work and how this information is even processed within the box jelly itself. If you look at the pictures, especially the one on the top left, you can see the little um, pigments there that are the parts of the eyes. Very crazy uh, organisms. Then, of course, we have class Anthozoa. And this is where you have the more familiar organisms, your sea anemones, gargonians, sea fans, and corals that make up a lot of your coral reef, but you also find them elsewhere as well. Now we get into some trickiness because uh, when we get into some of these various phylums like Nidaria, there are quite a lot of different strategies among the different classes. We're going to talk in general. Most Nidarians in terms of nutrition are what we call suspension feeders or filter feeders, uh, and they feed on plankton uh, and sometimes even small fish uh, using especially the nematocysts and their stinging cells. Uh, generally, undigested material is then... Uh, expelled through the oral opening uh, and that's pretty much how they do things now hermatypic corals obviously have a little bit of a different tale to tell they use that mutualistic relationship with the zooxanthellae algae living in their tissues as the majority source of their nutrition and we talked a little bit about that when we talked about coral reefs so keep in mind that that still is in play Now, in terms of reproduction, we'll talk about corals specifically because there are various different uh, options throughout the different classes within uh, phylum Nidaria. Uh, but as we're just doing a brief survey, uh, this will be an example. So through sexual reproduction, we have both what we call dioecious or hermaphroditic species. So uh, they can release gametes into the water. Uh, they can either release both or only one or the other, depending on the species. Uh, this generally means that there is external fertilization, so the egg and sperm have to meet up in the water column to get fertilized. Once that happens, plant, it becomes what we call planula larvae, and that will eventually flow along and attach to a substrate, uh, basically a bare piece of rock on the bottom, and it will form the first polyp. From there, you have asexual reproduction uh, through budding, where the polyp will continue to form other additional polyps. Again, asexual um, reproduction, eventually forming a big colony, which would be your coral. Now, other classes uh, do similar things, uh, but with differences. Obviously, with something like a, a jellyfish, which I mentioned before, and I showed you a little bit about the uh, diagram of how that works, it's a little bit different. They're not using any calcareous skeleton or developing multiple polyps through that. But um, it again, just gives you an image of what 
these uh, cnidarians do for reproduction. Now, in terms of cnidarians and their importance, um, really it cannot be overstated. Corals, especially, provide habitats for a huge amount of species, the most diverse uh, habitats on the, on the planet in terms of the ocean. So very, very important in terms of that. They're also, of course, important predators to the plankton community, uh, and they support a numerous symbiotic relationships throughout the reefs and throughout the world's oceans, including uh, things like jellyfish. This video is of a moon jelly uh, that I found, and all these little fish are hanging out under it. Now you might think, why would a little fish do that? This jellyfish has stinging cells all over it. Well, they're doing it for exactly the reason you probably would guess protection. That jellyfish stings can protect them from larger predators and fish. Just like a clownfish, they have some adaptations to avoid the stings. And of course, beyond ecology, Nidarians generally benefit our economy. You know, I, I go down to the Keys a couple of times a year just to go diving uh, because I'm, of course, a total like marine geek. Um, but a lot of people do as well. They come from around the world to Florida to be able to go out to our reefs and our beaches and enjoy what the, the corals have provided for us. And this is the same in other parts of the world. And that provides a huge economic boost for us. So these are really important aspects of, of why we need to protect and preserve coral reefs in general, and also the rest of the Nidarians that we talked about today. Our last phylum for today is phylum Tinafora, and the name comes from the Greek meaning comb bearers, as in a combing your hair sort of a thing. And if you look at the picture on the left there of the Tinafora, or the comb jelly we call it, uh, the various ciliated bands sort of have this look of a comb because of the cilia coming out both sides. That's where they get the name comb jelly. And they're generally also called like little sea walnuts and whatnot. They are uh, relatively small for the most part. You can fit them in the palm of your hand for the most part. And they're a lot of times very clear when we see them in our coast. And these ciliated bands help uh, the tenophores move around actually within the water as well. Now, they are filter feeders uh, and thus they need to be able to access prey. And so they use these long tentacles and they have what we call uh, sticky cells or coloblasts that help to grab zooplankton to bring it into their mouths to feed. Now remember, keep this in mind, cnidarians have stinging cells. Comb jellies are tenophores. They do not have stinging cells. They have those sticky cells, so very different between the two. Now as you can see through the picture on the left, Tenophores have this ability to kind of bend and reflect light and makes them look very iridescent, uh, very much like light going through a prism. So this happens a lot during the day. Now at night, a lot of the tenophores are also bioluminescent, which is that chemical light produced uh, by biological organisms in the ocean and other places as well. And so these are very things you normally would see. Now, Tenophores are what we call hermaphroditic, so they do release both egg and sperm, and they release them directly into the water column. So they have what we consider external fertilization. And of course, they are important plant predators to plankton. I mentioned this before. And the, the truth is, is that's what they do all day long. They try and eat and consume plankton, zooplankton. Now, in some areas, especially in the deeper sea, a lot of the prey atoms that they're going after also bioluminesces. And that's where you get the uh, red color of the tenophore, the comb jelly on the right. Um, as they're consuming the zooplankton that are bioluminescing and freaking out because they're being eaten, um, the red pigment within the comb jelly will block that bioluminescent light uh, from their digested food items as they're kind of going through, it, through that process. So it's kind of a neat adaptation used by the comb jellies in the deeper sea. All right, it's time to turn it back to you. Uh, and here we go. Here's your in-depth question. All three of the phyla that we've been talking about today are filter feeders, and they consume zooplankton. So what trophic level would you find filter feeders like this in? Explain your answer. Okay, until next time, keep thinking.